Welcome to Mastering Meds, Exploring Pharmacy Approaches in Hospital at Home, a webinar sponsored by the Hospital at Home Users Group and presented in partnership with the American Academy of Home Care Medicine and the American Hospital Association. We'd like to recognize a generous support of the John A. Hartford Foundation for the Users Group and for this webinar series. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Bruce Leff. A member of the Hospital at Home Users Group leadership team, Dr. Leff has been a leader of the hospital at home movement in the United States since the mid-1990s when he helped pioneer the model at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Today, he is a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where he directs Center for Transformative Geriatric Research. Please take it away, Dr. Leff. Thanks, John. So this webinar is being brought to you by the Hospital at Home Users Group. This is a group that was formed a little under two years ago. It initially started with existing hospital at home programs in the US and Canada that came together to share best practices and develop work groups to work on issues related to hospital at home program standards, quality indicators and quality standards, and payment and regulatory issues. The user group has expanded in the wake of the CMS waiver, and the URL is there, and we invite you all to go onto that site and feel free to join up in the users group either as a member uh, if you've taken care of patients in hospital at home or as an affiliate. Uh, today's webinar is the latest in a series of webinars that were launched after the CMS waiver was announced. The items listed in this slide are the webinars that have already uh, been presented and those webinars, uh, recordings and the slide decks and associated resource materials and technical assistance materials can be accessed on the Hospital at Home Users Group website or on the User Group Technical Assistance Center. Additional webinars are coming up soon. Our next topic for a webinar, which will be presented in about a month in early May, will be on patient identification for Hospital at Home. And we look forward to having you all attend that webinar. So today's webinar, Mastering Meds, Exploring Approaches to Pharmacy and Hospital at Home. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Linda DeCherry. I'm Linda DeCherry, I'm the Clinical Director at Mount Sinai. And after me is going to be um, David Levine, I'll let him introduce himself. Um, and then Don Mashney um, from the Pharmacy at Mount Sinai as well. So for disclosures, um, uh, David has um, a PI initiated grant from Bioformis and IBM and um, I have, I am a full-time employee at Mount Sinai, but we have a joint venture with Contessa Health and I have no personal financial um, interest in that joint venture. So the agenda today um, is going to be, uh, I'm going to talk about the pharmacy um, program at Mount Sinai with Hospital at Home. And then um, David's gonna speak about um, the same thing at Brigham. And lastly, um, Don is going to discuss the pharmacy considerations in general. All right, so I'm gonna go through the history at Mount Sinai. Um, I have presented in some of the webinars before, um, but we have um, been operating our hospital at home program since 2014. Um, and that has um, undergone many iterations um, for many parts of it, but I'm gonna speak specifically about the pharmacy um, here today. So for our first three years, um, we had a CMMI grant. Um, to um, uh, do hospital at home for Medicare fee-for-service patients um, in the New York area. And um, that grant was to cover all the services for um, the patients at that time, including the medications. We weren't billing the patients for their hospital at home episode. Instead, this grant was um, providing all of that. So that just use that as the kind of lens to think about this. We started as a faculty outpatient practice to provide this care. And what we did is we purchased um, a, uh, medications from the Mount Sinai outpatient pharmacy that we stocked in our practice. So we would, for example, um, uh, uh, get IV fluid bags and we would keep them in our practice or we would have ceftriaxone locked um, but in, in, our, in our practice. No controlled substances were we purchasing at that point um, to keep on in our, our stock but these would be the IV or infusion meds that we would be um, uh, normally getting from like an inpatient pharmacy um, we were stocking them in our practice. 
Um, patients, if they had meds that they already were taking, they were allowed to um, use that supply during their hospital episode. And then we also prescribed other meds to their outpatient pharmacy, um, which was paid through their um, uh, patient's pharmacy normal um, benefit. The um, disadvantage of that is that these meds weren't labeled per patient. There wasn't a pharmacist overseeing um, you know, what we were doing. We could consult the ID pharmacist, which we did um, often, but it wasn't um, you know, labeling everything um, per patient. And we were in an outpatient EMR. Um, and so it was really ordering things like that in, in that manner. And we didn't really have an MAR to um, uh, uh, track which meds were administered to patients. Um, then, um, till more recently, um, we had contracts um, with insurance companies for the care of patients. So these were bundled contracts um, that we negotiated um, um, in our partnership with Contessa uh, for care for 30 days for patients um, needing acute care first for the you know like four or five days of their acute care and then we would have a transitional um, period. Until last summer we were also still considered an outpatient practice um, and we would um, e-prescribe any IV meds that we needed to an infusion pharmacy including IV fluids that allowed us to use um, IV pumps and balls just like any outpatient infusion pharmacy would be able to um, you know uh, set up for us. Um, patients could take oral meds from their, if they were continuing them, they could continue them um, in the program. And any new oral or injectable meds we would prescribe to the retail pharmacy. And that was specifically how our contracts were set up, that those meds would not be included in our um, bundled arrangements. The issues we had there were that um, patients couldn't always arrange to pick up from their local um, pharmacies. Uh, and we also had sometimes issues with patients unable to pay the co-pays for medications. Um, the infusion pharmacy also was not as rapid as we always needed them um, to be. And then um, during the uh, height of the pandemic here in New York that was started last March, you know, a year ago, um, we started a new program called, in, called Completing Hospitalization at Home, where we could um, uh, have a patient um, finish their last couple of days of their hospitalization at home. We, continue, we were still at that point a faculty outpatient practice, um, but it was the hospital that was paying for those days. The hospital was going to be um, uh, able to get the the, the normal rate for the inpatient stay, but because of the pandemic, we had made some arrangements and the rest of the days, the hospital was um, internally compensating the hospital at home program for that. Um, we then, we continued to get IV meds from the infusion pharmacy that we then paid for. Um, it still allowed us to use pumps and, and balls. Um, patients could take meds at home um, that they already had prescribed, but we then got um, all the orals and injectable meds from the outpatient hospital pharmacy that was invoiced to us. Um, and again, we continued to have the problem with the infusion pharmacy not being able to um, uh, uh, prepare the meds as quickly as we needed. They were not used to that um, system but the hospital outpatient pharmacy was able to do everything uh, rapidly. We would get a brown bag of the meds, they were labeled as outpatient meds, and um, they would um, ideally go home with the patient right in the ambulance um, for the rest of, of their time at home, or if we had to courier it, um, we could do that. And then um, the, the big difference, as everyone knows, uh, started last November with the fee-for-service Medicare waiver. We had actually, a couple months before that, converted ourselves to an inpatient EPIC, um, but now we were truly an inpatient unit for the fee-for-service Medicare um, uh, waiver. And we were not using, you know, in any way, the patient's pharmacy benefit. That was very important. We had to provide all their medications, just like the inpatient um, would have normally. So we've now started to get IV meds from the inpatient pharmacy. So that's new for us. Um, we do still get pumps and balls from an infusion pharmacy um, uh, because our inpatient pharmacy is currently not set up to provide pumps. 
We do allow patients to take some of their meds from home if, if needed, um, but we are getting the orals and injectables from the inpatient pharmacy, and ideally we get all their meds that way. Um, we are dispensing five days at a time, and we do have difficulties with the uh, controlled medications, um, no ideal plan um, uh, for that at this time. One of the things that um, we're very excited about is that we now have patients who are um, being admitted who are in our contracts with an insurance company for 30-day bundles of care who do need to use an outpatient pharmacy for some meds, and we have our fee-for-service patients who need to completely use an inpatient pharmacy for all their medications. And um, that started to get very confusing. And so the one thing that we're very excited about, and it, it hopes we hope that it'll go live in the next week or so, um, is a new order set that allows us to dispense meds to either one. So um, I know this is not the easiest slide to read, but you can see this: the top half is the ACE inhibitor choices um, for um, patients, for the inpatient pharmacy to dispense. It's defaulted at five days, but we could say up to seven days, or if we think we only need three days, we can, we can um, do that and we can click on those. Or we can use the bottom half of the order set where it's the outpatient pharmacy and we could pick the same enalapril, let's say, um, five milligram tablets. And then at the very end, um, there'll be, it'll ask us which pharmacy we want to e-prescribe to. Um, in, like on the next screen. So um, this is a very nice um, new uh, feature that we're gonna hopefully go live with. Um, so now I'm gonna go on to some of the administration of the meds. Um, so for us, um, all the IV meds, all the uh, um, fluids, IV fluids are administered by the nurse when he or she is in the home or it's on a pump, so TID meds will run on a pump that the patient does not expect it to do anything with. The only thing the patient or their family is taught is about all the alarms on the pump and how to stop it and then what to call for, but they're never expected to like hep block themselves or start a new um, uh, pump. Um, it's all, that's all done by the nurse. Our sub -Q the nurse would administer our oral meds are pre-poured into a pill box. Um, we do ask um, questions um, prior to taking the patient home and again in the home by the nurse kind of to make sure that we feel comfortable with the patient being able to do that self-administration or if their family is doing it for them. And all the meds are documented now by a nurse in an MAR. Um, we do have our nurses on a different EMR than the physicians and rest, like they're not in Epic, they're in a um, in home care home base. Um, but that um, MAR is available to us at the end of the episode um, for, um, uh, you know, review and it's, it, it's, it gets uploaded into the media section of, of Epic. Um, and all of that, um, the pre-pouring and everything that the, is done by um, our nurses um, from the start of care. And so a couple technical issues we have. One of our big challenges for us is that we, um, we pre-admit patients. Um, so um, you know, we have uh, four emergency rooms we admit from, but our, our virtual unit for our fee-for-service patients are only in one of our hospitals. And so if they are in um, um, the, one of the other emergency rooms, we can't have them admitted already to place the full orders in the other hospital um, yet. Um, and so what we do is pre-admit orders, um, but that in the regular workflow of pre-admit orders, the pharmacy would never get those orders. Um, and now we will be able to notify the, the pharmacy of orders in the pre-admit status, and the pharmacy will be able to run a report and start to prepare those medications for us, especially important for IV meds and um, so forth that need to be mixed. Um, and then uh, once the patient is actually leaving the emergency room and the pre-admit orders become full orders, then they can be dispensed and released to us. Um, so we're excited about um, that new feature that also will go live with those orders in the next week or so. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, David. And David, can you introduce yourself? Sure thing, thanks so much, Linda. Um, pharmacy is so complex, <laughs> but hoping uh, to share our experiences a little bit. I'm David Levine. I'm a primary care physician and a home hospital physician. I get to be one of the medical directors for strategy and innovation at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Med School. 
and want to share with you all a little bit about how we do pharmacy at Brigham. Kind of our phase one, wanted to try to take the same format as Linda for you all. We started um, back in 2016 as a research project. Actually, we were a small pilot randomized control trial at that time. And then we relaunched into a larger randomized control trial. And at that time, we were housed um, at the Brigham Women's Physicians Organization, uh, which oftentimes carries more innovation-like work um, at our institution. Um, and then about two years after that, uh, we, we moved over uh, into the hospital side, um, and we were um, considered really a service line at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And during all that time, uh, for, the, for the most part, um, we used our outpatient pharmacy, but there was a little catch. Our outpatient pharmacy was fueled and supplied by our inpatient pharmacy. And so what would happen is, is that all meds would go from the inpatient pharmacy through a tube system up to the outpatient pharmacy, get labels as outpatient medications, and then get picked up by our team. You can imagine uh, that you know, this certainly introduced some lags um, and uh, definitely had some concerns for us. Uh, you know, our outpatient pharmacy is not open 24 seven and acute care happens 24 um, seven. You know, we uh, would have to you know, get double doses, for example, of medications on Saturday because our pharmacy was not open on Sunday. And just to clarify, our, our, we insource really all of our pharmacy needs. We find that to be very beneficial. And, and so you'll, we actually pick up our meds every day. Um, again, it's acute care and things change and prescriptions change and doses change and meds change. And so we feel like daily pickup is often quite helpful. Um, but being in an outpatient setting um, and, and using an outpatient EHR system meant that we had no use of any of the inpatient EHR tools, right? So a lot of the kind of uh, medication safety tools that are built into EHRs, interaction checkers often are not running the same way in the outpatient setting as they are in the inpatient setting. So that was a little bit of a bummer. Um, we also didn't have the awesome power of our pharmacists to be doing a lot of our order checking when we were in that outpatient setting. In many institutions, and in particular ours, our pharmacists check nearly every single inpatient order that comes across their desk. Um, and when you're not using uh, an inpatient EHR, you don't usually have that opportunity. Uh, most outpatient pharmacists are not doing that kind of check the same way that an inpatient pharmacist is. Um, and we also, you know, I learned um, early on that there is quite a specialization uh, of pharmacists and there are outpatient pharmacists and inpatient pharmacists. Um, and oftentimes, uh, no matter how dedicated to home hospital our outpatient pharmacists were, they, they didn't quite have the expertise of some of their inpatient pharmacy colleagues. They actually quickly gained it as they worked with our team um, and saw these inpatient drugs uh, come across uh, their desk to fill, but it certainly was a learning curve for many of them. Um, and they would often be on the phone uh, with the pharmacists downstairs uh, in order to properly kind of uh, dose or dose adjust or answer some of our, our pharmacy related questions. And during this entire phase, um, we were never using a, the patient's pharmacy benefit. Uh, you know, everything was paid uh, really as a cost transfer internally at Brigham and Women's Hospital. The pharmacy would bill us um, at cost for the drugs that we used. Um, that, that was the cost that our program uh, would pay for. So phase two um, is oop, and really where we are now. So last year, we were fortunate. Uh, we had planned, we had actually planned since 2016 to move to an inpatient EHR system. Some of you may have heard me talk about that in our tech uh, webinar. Um, and in 2020, we did, uh, about three, three or four years later. And uh, with that came an inpatient build and all the inpatient pharmacy tools. And with that also came the workflows that allowed our inpatient pharmacy to directly dispense to us. And so Again, this was amazing. Um, our pharmacists were, our, we now have access to our inpatient pharmacy 24 uh, seven drugs. Um, we can request quick fills of just about anything. Um, and uh, our pharmacy team in the inpatient setting can, can meet those goals, meet those needs pretty well. Um, we now have kind of all the EHR tools that we need as well. I'll talk about in a, in a coming slide. We still don't use our pharmacy benefit. Um, and I saw a couple questions in the chat about labeling. I think this is an interesting gray area, and I know Don is gonna speak to this a little bit as well. There's not a clear consensus um, on how medications for this need to be labeled. 
Um, you know, our pharmacists have, have gone and, and discussed this a lot, and I know other pharmacists around the country have discussed this. Um, and so it, but it's, it's really, to my knowledge, not exactly clear. Um, and that and it's probably because we're in a very novel space when it comes to this kind of uh, medication work and pharmacy work. And so a lot of folks do think that um, it, it's perfectly adequate to have an inpatient label on your drug. Other folks think that you need more of an outpatient label on your drug. And oftentimes there's not too much difference between those labels, save maybe for addresses. Um, and so not clear exactly where that lands. And I think every institution needs to choose um, for themselves exactly how they want to label their drugs. Just wanted to also speak to physician pharmacy. So this is a, you know, an important part of our um, capability at, at Brigham. And I think uh, you know, really helps us provide pharmacy-wise acute care in the home. And so our physicians carry first and urgent dose medications. We basically have a, a little mini pharmacy on our backs. Um, and we can dispense those um, as needed by patients um, and kind of have our workhorse antibiotics, diuretics, and a whole slew of other medications. And our pharmacy collaborates with us uh, to essentially restock this pack um, as it's used. Um, I know a big topic that folks have asked a lot about and are curious about is patient-administered medications. I think, you know, again, <laughs> Hospitals need to do diligence that they feel like they're abiding by the CMS conditions of participation and that they're abiding by their own local policies about physicians, uh, about patients taking medications on their own. Um, at Brigham, we have a patient administered medication uh, policy uh, and we abide by it in the home as well. And it works pretty well. And it basically boils down to let patients take meds, um, but check and document very carefully um, what is being taken, when is it being taken, how often and what dose. Um, these are all um, extremely important. And, and for some patients, it may not be the right thing, but a lot of folks, um, patient administered medications is very common um, for us in home hospital operations for pharmacy. Finally, just wanted to again, um, you know, speak to the fact that our inpatient EHR build has been exceptionally important um, for our pharmacy uh, needs, um, whether it's being able to check interactions, dosing, pharmacist review, um, as well as the ease of the interface, because it's built for rapidly changing doses and frequencies and, and things of that sort. And not to mention the ability for our nursing and paramedic teams to um, document in a, an inpatient type MAR um, are all super critical, um, I think, to, to delivering acute care. And actually probably one of the few places where we actually have an evidence base to suggest that safety improves. Um, we're also very soon gonna be um, using portable um, documentation, um, using our MAR uh, with our cell phones, being able to barcode and scan our meds in the patient's home. That's you know a, a, not a technology we've been able to implement yet, but we're hoping to implement actually quite soon. Um, in the coming month or two um, and are excited about that because again it's it's improving the safety uh, of, of the care we deliver for patients. That's a that's a snapshot of safety at Brigham. Pass it over uh, to Don, the real expert who's actually a pharmacist. Oh thank you very much. Um, an outpatient pharmacist for the most part, um, especially pharmacy and outpatient pharmacy is what I do at Mount Sinai but um, this has been an interesting topic, and I think Sinai has the capability of, um, once we formalize all of our policies and procedures, of providing some excellent pharmacy services, since we do have outpatient in, and inpatient pharmacies. Um, so I think, you know, one of the key things that, uh, where we have some work uh, left to do at Sinai is to develop policies and procedures that will you know, guide the growth of our hospital at home services. Um, you know, things to consider are patient education. Uh, we've talked about the control substances already, um, self-administered and infused medications, the storage of medications at home, which is very important. The labeling requirements, which um, I'll speak a little bit more to, um, and the documentation of the, the uh, the, the medication administration, be it by the patient or by a nurse. Um, and of course, the disposal of the unused medications. So all of these things are important considerations. Um, as, it's, as was mentioned earlier, you know, we still need to, well, we're 
in the process of finalizing our um, hospital at home specific order sets. Um, and something to consider on the pharmacy side is the off processes so that we can optimize our efficiencies in the pharmacy and you know, minimize provider disruptions to the EHR workflow. And um, another thing to consider too is adherence to formulary. So if those medications are coming out of the inpatient pharmacy, that's very important. Um, also want to document workflows uh, or, or develop workflows and document to accommodate decentralized pharmacy services when those are being used. We've, uh, Dr. Desherry has talked about that. Very important. And um, also capturing pharmacy charges upon a, uh, administration of the medications or dispensation of the medication. So, uh, um, you know, if, if we're dispensing five day supplies at Sinai, um, we need to be assured that the, the charges will drop accordingly. Um, so I, I think, you know, um, the most important things here to consider is how we actually document these, uh, the, the administration of these medications. And I think the one, the greatest area of opportunity are some mobile health technologies um, that can be used for these patients that are in hospital at home service. So dose alerts uh, to remind them when to take their medications, education that might be available to them on their mobile device, um, the scanning capabilities that will allow us to capture when the, you know, if a patient scans a, a tagged prescription bottle or a blister card, um, the ability to actually capture uh, that dose is being taken. Um, and then, of course, side effects and symptoms reporting capabilities would be um, ideal if, if we could actually capture that um, electronically uh, using a mobile device. And I think it's really important that um, we need to consider what kind of medications the patient already has in their home. Um, Over-the-counter meds, nutritional products, uh, prescription medications already in the home. I think it's important that we actually record and document all the medications that are in the home to make sure that there's no duplication in therapies and drug interactions that could be occurring between medications dispensed from a retail pharmacy or from the outpatient pharmacy at the hospital or the inpatient pharmacy. Um, refrigeration and storage of the medications, um, ideally, what we'd like to have is our temperature monitored refrigerators um, in the patient's home um, and dedicated specifically to medications, not necessarily stored with foods. But obviously that's not a very practical solution right now. But it's, de it's definitely important that we segregate medications in the patient's refrigerator at home, uh, potentially putting them in, in plastic food storage bags when there's re uh, refrigeration that's required um, of medications. And, it, and of course, if the meds are stored um, at room temperature, we want them in a cool, dry space, not a bathroom. And typically, room temperature is considered uh, 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So typically what you'd find in your home, but um, oftentimes the labeling on a medication will say that excursions are permissible between 59 and 86 degrees. So if it, if it happens to sit uh, on a windowsill exposed to the sun at higher temperatures for a short period of time, that's probably okay. So the legal and regulatory considerations for this are complicated. Um, labeling requirements for a medication that's administered in the hospital are very different from the labeling requirements or outpatient medications dispensed at a retail pharmacy. Um, and the state boards of pharmacy requirements, they may evolve differently for hospital at home patients. Um, I would consider that it's probably uh, smart to label all medications that are being sent to a patient's home as outpatient um, medications so that we, we meet the strictest requirements um, in terms of you know, what's required on that label and what's safest for the patient. Obviously for um, infused medications, uh, since they're gonna be administered by a nurse, inpatient labeling is probably adequate there, but I would, you should always, always uh, err on the side of caution for control substances, substances and adhere to the outpatient labeling requirements. And, you know, some, hosp some inpatient hospital pharmacies really don't have 
the software system to actually produce those outpatient labels. So that's something that needs to be overcome if inpatient pharmacies are going to be providing these medications. Um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. The law requires that you have certain types of information on the label. It can actually be handwritten on the label. Um, doesn't look terribly professional that way, but there are some safety issues to consider when you send, home, send uh, medications to a patient's home if those meds aren't labeled properly. I just want to address some of the payer considerations here. Um, in the retail pharmacy world, we're not allowed to actually bill medications to a patient's outpatient pharmacy benefit when the patient is under hospital care. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the enforcement of this is, I don't know that uh, our pharmacies have ever been dinged because we filled a prescription at one of our outpatient pharmacies for a patient that was admitted, but we try to avoid those situations because, because it is prohibited in the contracts. So we have to be careful with that. Even for those programs that are considered outpatient programs, the PBMs or the companies that administer the pharmacy benefit don't necessarily endorse the use of the pharmacy benefit if those patients are under hospital care. So just considerations to think about. And I think it might be appropriate to avoid the use of outpatient pharmacy benefits simply because the pharmacists don't have a full record of the patient's medications and it's hard to do due diligence for that patient if we can't do screenings for drug interactions and appropriate dosing, et cetera. So I think just from a pharmacy practice standpoint, I'm, I would be a proponent of the inpatient pharmacy um, having the capability of filling all of these medications. There's going to be some significant considerations with that, but something to, to think about. Just in terms of good pharmacy practice, it should be one pharmacy providing all the medications for these patients. I just want to point out that there are opportunities for medications that are typically infu uh, infused intravenously. And I, I've given you a short list of medications that be, can be given by IV push um, that could be an advantage to you uh, in delivering care for these patients. Um, you may be aware of these already, but these are meds that are typically given by the intravenous route, but we can also give them by the IV push route. So I just wanted to make you aware that there are opportunities there. And um, when in doubt, check with your hospital pharmacist and they'll be able to provide you this, this type of information um, that might be, be more convenient and cost effective in delivering the medications to the patients in their home. Great. So um, this is Bruce Leff again. Just a big thanks to David, Linda, and Don for terrific presentations. We now have just a little over 15 minutes for, for questions, and uh, I'll ask Linda and Don to leave their videos on. And we've had a very lively um, set of questions come in in the Q&A portion of Zoom, and I'm trying to been trying to group those questions into <clears throat> some relevant topic areas. And maybe I'll just start with a more theoretical one and I'll, I'll leave this open to, to anyone who wants to take it and maybe you all can riff off of it a little bit. So we've heard a lot of details today about the state of what is being done. I'm just wondering, and perhaps some others are wondering, you know, if, if we could wave a magic wand, what would the ideal pharmacy system for a hospital at home look like? Uh, just wondering, I'm sure you guys have been thinking about that a little bit. I mean, is it the development of some kind of wonderful Pixis that somehow gets refilled every day and has cameras in it to confirm patient self-administration? I'm just wondering if you guys have had any thoughts about that, because maybe there are some entrepreneurs on the line today who want to start a company or develop that kind of technology. I can start a little bit. I think Don already alluded to some of this. I, I agree that it would be most ideal to have one pharmacy do everything for exactly the reasons he mentioned. Um, and um, I think it should be the inpatient pharmacy. That's what we are. We are an inpatient service and it should be just like any other in, inpatient. I'm um, probably a little more agnostic as to the um, the method of, of doing that, you know, David brought up that the nurses are coming to Brigham every morning, picking up the daily supply of meds for the patient and bringing them to their home. And that's not how we do it. We do it as five days and, and pre-pour in a pill box. Um, 
but I, I do agree that our system is not ideal with regard to two EHRs. And I would love this whole idea. I mean, I saw that in Australia where um, people had Epic Rover, the nurses had Epic Rover, and they were um, scanning the meds just like a nurse would scan the meds at the bedside prior to putting it in the pill cup for the patients, you know, right then and there. I think that would be wonderful. I, I, that's something we should aim, aim towards. Um, yeah, Linda, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's, that's the pilot I was alluding to where we'll be barcoding. We are going to be um, trying that with an Epic Rover um, type program. Um, so we're really excited to, to try that out. It's been a long time coming to get that all set up. Um, but it makes a lot of sense. Like it really, you know, if we want that same level of accuracy that we demand in the inpatient setting of barcoding, because uh, we have a great randomized control trial showing that it reduces medication administration errors, like we should, we should probably be there in the home too. Um, obviously, it's, it's harder. <laughs> um, but uh, we're, we're excited for that. I think I'll also just add, you know, being a little future thinking, I also saw a, a question on this in the Q&A. I think, you know, we would like to see the day where we are able to put a, a little mini medication administration system in patients' homes. Um, I, I think right now there are some technologies out there that, that do that. Some of them are quite cumbersome to set up. Um, you know, most of us have length of stays at around four or five days. If it takes you an hour to set up, you know, a patient, 20 patient medications, you can't, you can't do that. Uh, it doesn't make sense for a four day length of stay. So just take the machine back and bring it to another patient's home. Um, but I do think that there are, are some nice technologies out there as well as some technologies that are developing right now where we will be able to, you know, essentially create a remotely controlled uh, kind of me uh, medication administration system. Um, and so seeing kind of technology get better as well as our workflows get better and connectivity with EHRs get better. I think it will be an exciting place to see, you know, we see uh, folk just to call out the Australians again, who are always ahead of us on this. Um, you know, there's a, a remotely programmable IV pump that Australia is, is now using so that they can change the, change the dose of the, the, you know, change the fluid, uh, the fluids uh, remotely, uh, you know, 150 cc's an hour. No, we want 200 cc's an hour and you can do it remotely. Um, so, you know, we have none of that capability right now in the U.S. and is a really interesting place to think about from a pharmacy standpoint. David, can you just uh, maybe explain, or Linda, Epic Rover for folks who are unfamiliar with that label? Sure. Yeah. And, and again, no, no like personal connection to the Epic product at all. Um, but essentially what it is, is a, an EHR on mobile that is highly functional. Most EHRs today have some sort of a mobile system and Epic often used as Haiku or Canto. Um, it's mostly a read-only system. The, cha the big deal with Rover is it's no longer read-only, it's now very much an interactive system. So you can barcode scan, you can enter data into flow sheets. Um, I know that there are nurses in, in, that use Rover, for example, and never touch a desktop computer their entire shift. They do their whole note in Rover. Um, they do all their MAR documentation in Rover. They do all their barcoding in Rover. They never have to touch a keyboard or a desktop computer. Um, and so Rover essentially is uh, the EHR on mobile, but not just read-only, but also kind of being able to push data to the EHR. Great. So um, next question. Um, there was a question in the chat and, and just wanted to get Don's opinion on this. So, so far, it, it, I don't think programs are sending pharmacists to the home, right? They're doing their uh, pharmacy duties um, the way pharmacists often do. Is there, do you think that there is a role for that in hospital at home? Are there use cases for that where that would be advantageous? I, I was just curious about that. Oh, absolutely. I think um, I think to be able to connect a hospital pharmacist with the patient after they're admitted to the hospital at home service, where they can review the medication um, profile, uh, the the uh, EHR record, review medications that the patient might have at home, um, any kind of over the counter products the patient might be using. Um, I think that would be very valuable to incorporate a pharmacist into this service. And um, I think also the integration of mobile technologies with the EHR, I think that's going to be a, a huge area of opportunity too um, that would provide patient education, uh, 
documentation of administration of medications. I, I think there's a lot of opportunities for pharmacists to get involved. I, I mean, just at a minimum, if there was a pharmacist assigned to the hospital at home service, you know, some outbound calls to those patients to review their medications would be very helpful. And uh, I, I think it would go a long way to improving outcomes if the importance of taking those medications was stressed. So yeah, that huge area of opportunity there. Thanks, Don. Um, there were lots of questions in the Q&A on delivery of meds to the home. I think especially in the context of you know, changing regimens. David, you mentioned your inpatient pharmacy is now available to you 24 seven and they can fill anything. What happens at two in the morning if something needs to go out to the home? How are, how are the programs, how are you, both of your programs dealing with that, that last mile delivery piece? Um, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, at the Mount Sinai Hospital, we have an inpatient and an outpatient pharmacy. And during uh, the operating hours of the outpatient pharmacy, that's nine to five, Monday through fr Friday hours, the outpatient pharmacy does provide medications, but um, the inpatient pharmacy does cover the off hours. Uh, so, you know, we, we do have that capability um, at the hospital. But uh, once again, we lose the connectivity between the operating system in the outpatient setting and the, op and the EHR. So um, there's, that, there's that gap that we still haven't gotten past yet. For us, I mean, another thing to add to that is the key part is not just the pharmacy hours, it's who's going to be available to administer whatever it is. Because we um, certainly could courier meds to a patient at that time. Um, but we don't ever ask the patient to then open up that brown bag and take a med from it. Um, the nurse would be the one, you know, pre-pouring it or having it as a bottle for a, a PRN, like a PRN Tylenol. Um, so most often those after hours is going to be a paramedic and using the formula the paramedic has on their ambulance, um, if that's really what's needed um, in the middle of the night. Yeah, I think Bruce, just to answer your question, um, a couple options for us, um, but yeah, we, we can access kind of any med at any time from the inpatient pharmacy. Linda's totally right. You got to think about who's actually delivering it. Um, our team pretty much insources all delivery of medications. We don't use a courier service most of the time. Um, it turns out to just not usually be fast enough um, for us. And so uh, usually it's our team members uh, doing that delivery and, and you know we do it such that they pick things up on the morning and they have all their meds for the day type of thing um, for the and you know it's not always the case because acute care changes but and in the off hours we also have mobile integrated health paramedics just like Linda talked about they would be able to administer meds on their formulary they could also go um, and pick up a medication um, from our inpatient pharmacy if instructed to do so but that would not be kind of our standard operating procedure. And then finally, we have our physicians uh, who are on call 24 hours a day, and they do have um, kind of their, their medications as well, as I mentioned. And so it, they also could um, be expected to deliver a medication in the off hours. Great. Great answers. Um, Linda and David, there, there were some questions about, uh, you, you both made reference to shifting hospital or being certainly being aware of your hospital policies and how it relates to medication administration in a hospital at home. Just wondering if there are specific sort of categories in the context of pharmacy that have come up that you've had to go back and retool your hospital policies around. What should, what should hospital at home program developers be thinking about as they go about this and have to navigate policy development and adjustments for implementation? I know medication self-administration clearly won. Are there others? You know, Bruce, we've been really lucky um, that many of the drug administration guidelines and many of the pharmacy policies at Brigham were written in a flexible sort of way already that they didn't require a lot of change. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, Don mentioned kind of IV push. Uh, at Brigham, used to be prior to the, the kind of crisis uh, in, uh, in Puerto Rico, um, there actually used to be almost no allowable IV push in the hospital. Um, and then once that happened, many drugs were moved to IV push um, kind of DAGs, drug administration guidelines, 
even for example, ceftriaxone. So Brigham ceftriaxone prior to the crisis was an IV piggyback, it was a drip. Uh, and, but afterward then turned to IV push. And for those of us who know kind of home infusion and home care medicine, um, like IV push ceftriaxone is a, is a stalwart. <laughs> and so uh, is a mainstay. And so we um, very fortunately, you know, most of all those IV push guidelines came into effect kind of after we were really getting big at Brigham. And so we were able to use most of those, but that's another example of where I think it's a really good idea to align yourself with those DAGs, right? So that like there's really nice clarity and otherwise you end up having to recreate all of those DAGs for home hospital. Um, and so being able to say, no, no, we're, we're following our hospital's drug administration guidelines um, is, is pretty powerful. Um, but it may, depending on your hospital, require some amendments to those. Um, and, and that's pretty reasonable. Uh, for us, we've been pretty lucky and, and haven't had to do that for, for most of our drugs. Yeah, and we're still going through some of those. We also haven't had to change um, anything yet. Uh, the labeling is one of the things that we're making some decisions on um, and that, that may require us to um, then change um, uh, the policy. But medication self-administration was one thing that we had to very consciously change. We added a clause to our policy. That's under, for us, that was under nursing, not under pharmacy policies. And, um, we added a clause for hospital at home um, specifically, um, you know, with these certain screens, then you can do that. Um. Just picking up on medication self-administration, there were a bunch of questions about that in, in the Q&A and two big issues. Number one, um, do you have any sort of litmus test to determine patient ability to actually engage in self-administration, and then the documentation of uh, meds that are self-administered, ways of how you all have been approaching that. Yes, yes to that first one. So we definitely um, screen the patient in the emergency room to understand if they are gonna be able to manage this by themselves and who, if they can't, who will be the one helping them, kind of for all issues related to hospital home, not just the medications. And then our nurses um, in the home do need to ask, um, I don't have the questions at the top of, my, uh, top of my head right now, but it's basically questions related to that, that, you know, are they, uh, do they understand that they have to take these meds and what, you know, how to do that and if it's going to be the patient or their family member. Um, and documentation, it's um, the nurse fills the pill box and then the nurse um, reviews the pill box on the next visit to see if indeed was taken and then documents that it was taken on that next visit. Um, so that's how our, our meds are documented. Yeah, and Bruce, we because we're kind of fully in the in inpatient MAR for our nurses and paramedics, um, there is a, a nice way inside of the MAR to document that it was patient administered um, and that they kind of attested to taking it. But it is a really important part. And I can tell you on our home hospital call today, we were discussing how important it is to like onerously and one by one confirm medications that were self-administered. Um, obviously, you know, Big, big safety issues can happen if, if that's not clear. Um, and so it is really important to make sure you have a patient who's capable of doing that um, or a caregiver who's capable of monitoring it um, <clears throat> or be able to, uh, and, and, as, and then document that it happened that way. Great. I think we're kind of a time for the Q&A portion of the webinar. So I wanted to thank, again, our really terrific panel Don, Linda, and David, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and uh, taking all these questions. And uh, just to tell the audience that um, uh, you, there we have our, our ongoing uh, technical assistance site at the Hospital at Home Users Group and at the Technical Assistance Center. The URLs are on the slide. Uh, the featured resource uh, recently created is the annotated CMS waiver. A document, which I think you'll all find useful, especially if you're in the process of putting together your application for the CMS hospital-based uh, payment waiver. Uh, if you've exhausted your uh, Netflix um, uh, to watch list, uh, remember here is a list of the webinars that we've already done that are available on, on the site. Just to let you know that the World Hospital at Home Congress meeting is coming up 
uh, in mid-ish April, start from uh, April 19th to the 21st. This meeting was supposed to take place uh, in Vienna, Austria, but it will be virtual this year. It's a terrific meeting. Uh, the last World Congress uh, was held in Madrid two years ago this time of the year. Uh, at that meeting, there were over 450 participants. Uh, my bet is that we're going to have similar numbers this year for the virtual meeting. You can get to hear what colleagues around the world are doing. Uh, and there's really some terrific, terrific progress being made in the model uh, around the world. And you can, uh, you can get to meet your colleagues, uh, you know, international colleagues from Spain and France and uh, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. It's a, it's a really terrific group. And uh, you'll feel like you're with your tribe if you attend. We also have the Hospital at Home Users Group Annual Meeting. That's the uh, folks from the US and Canada. Uh, and so we advise you to save the date. That will be October 28th, virtual annual meeting. Uh, and more to come on how to register for that, but please save the date, October 28th. And uh, thank you. So um, uh, join the users group. You can fill out the form on the users group site. Uh, chat with us about topics for our next webinar. If there are things you want to hear, please tell us. The reason we're having the, the pharmacy webinar today is that there was a groundswell of demand for that. And there's more help on the, tech, on the Technical Assistance Center, a lot of useful resources and tools for hospital home implementation. So thanks again for uh, joining us today. We really enjoyed, um, enjoyed having you. Great questions, great participation. And we'll see you next month for the next webinar. Take care, everyone.